Welcome to Scaling Up, where we explore the strategies that propel businesses to new heights. I am your host, Chad Kessler, a sales acceleration advisor serving the Philadelphia and Delmarva region. Today, we're diving into a topic that is near and dear to my heart, value-based pricing, a transformational approach to pricing products based on the value they bring, not the cost to produce. You're listening to Scaling Up, a podcast for business leaders. Our guest is Todd Snellgrove, a global expert with over 20 years in helping businesses of all sizes capture the value they bring to their customers. Is an author of the bestseller, Value First, Then Price, Todd has helped company of all sizes, from startups to multi-billion dollar corporations, maximize profitability through their pricing. Todd, welcome to the show. Hey Chad, thanks for having me on. Absolutely, absolutely. So I'm looking forward to this conversation because uh, we've talked and nauseam a little bit about price, but I think there's a lot we can share with the audience today. So looking forward to it. So you've been a pioneer in value-based pricing. Can you share your journey, talk about what sparked your interest in this pricing strategy and just give the audience an understanding of you? Yes, Chad. It's kind of an interesting journey and I'll try to keep it short, but I work for a big company and the sales team felt that they had a value proposition to the technical buyer. And when I was working with them in a sales role, I was kind of a Canadian account person, we kept getting pushback from the customer, but you're 20% or 30% higher. And we saw this evolution where price became a big focus, even though they thought there was value. And I started down a jury journey saying to the sales team, if we could quantify the value for the customer, then they could justify paying a price premium for the products, the services, and the software that we offered. So I asked the sales team, if I could do this, would it help you? And they said, if you could, it would be amazing. So I went down a journey of value quantification. And from that, it enabled the sales team to get higher prices quicker with customers because they could show if you spend X with us, which I know is more than something similar, not the same, they were able to get the order, discount less, and the customers would be happier. That's what started the journey. And from there, I've just picked up a lot of pricing strategy stuff from a lot of really smart people around the world and look back and help clients apply it. And it's really helped change the game because selling something is great, but you have to get paid for it. And the customer has to want to pay you for it. Oh, absolutely. And, and, you know, it always feels good when you get your share that you feel like, you know, you help generate that value for the client. So maybe walk me through, because you've got a lot of different examples, maybe walk through a story about one where you achieve significant growth by properly placing the price. What insights can our audience gain, regardless of their size, from that journey? I'll, I'll give a recent example that's an SMB client. And again, just try to keep it as generic as possible because hopefully there's takeaways. But the client was at a point where two things were happening. They had maxed out. They couldn't scale up anymore. They were at the point where they were within the marketplace, but they were also getting pushed back and there was a juncture point. And I was doing a conference and as you said, this value, value, value word kept coming up. And this lady came up to me and says, I need help. I said, what? And she goes, I'm meeting 150 CEOs of local hospital chains. And they've all said to me, you need to define, explain your value to us because we cannot justify paying you $80 an hour to place a registered nurse in our local hospitals when we hire them and pay 38. That's just too big of a gap. We, we know you bring value, but we can't justify that difference. I'm not an expert in the hospital world or anything like that, but I said, well, let's just start with trying to understand what your value proposition is. And then we started to quantify it. And we just, you know, I asked a lot of questions and we drew it out. And it turns out that over a six month period, paying somebody $80 an hour outsourced is less expensive than hiring somebody at $38. I won't bore you with all the math, but it's it's referenced and linked and, and data from the hospitals. And she was like, wow, I was at the point where I was either going to lose the business, I mean, because pricing was becoming the focus, lower your, lower your price, lower your price, and I was getting less share. And now that we can quantify that value, we can start to market it, PowerPoints for the CEO presentation, one-page sheets. And we've also helped her hire a local salesperson that understands how to sell value, not just outsource uh, people by the hour, by the body. So it kind of worked backwards into the whole sales structure of the of our company. Oh, that's great. I mean, I think yeah, you know, 
that's a great example, right? You know, it, they're looking at going, I can hire somebody directly and they're looking at the hourly rate that they pay and they're not taking in a lot of the soft things like compensation, turnover, you know, having to go out and actually hire them versus bringing somebody in while well, two and a half times more, right? But you get a, a plug and play and, and you take a lot of those other costs out of the situation and you get consistent people showing up because yeah, you, you're using that sort of workforce. So that's a great example. I'll give you a quick quote, and it came from a chief procurement officer in Europe, and I just, I think it summarizes all this. You might understand your value, but you have to articulate it in our language, in numbers we understand, for us to understand why we should pay you for it. And the best part of her quote was, if you can't do it, don't expect me to do it. So that's what these hospital CEOs are saying. All these other terms we understand, but I don't know what they mean. I don't know the dollars and cents, and I'm too busy to figure out why I should pay you double. That's your job. So Chad, I mean, you've been involved in sales your whole career. And of course, pricing is part of that. What are some of the controversial or counterintuitive things that you've run into when you try to do value-based pricing uh, within companies you've worked with? Yeah. So, uh, you know, it, 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 when I started my career, you know, having a value-based price because you can really see what our product is. So you had to justify it every day. And, um, you know, when I got into setting prices and working with sales teams around the globe, you know, a quote would come in and first thing everybody would do is go, okay, what's the cost to go, go do that and then do a markup and, and just kind of being new to it. You know, I just said, we don't need a cost to set a price. And, and saying that, you know, it is really, you know, kind of controversial to a lot of people. And it kind of takes them back. It's like, well, we have to know the cost. I'm like, we will have to know the cost eventually, but. Why is the customer calling us? What is the value we're bringing? Why are we going to get a minority share? Are we getting majority share? You know, what's driving this? What value am I bringing? And, you know, really going about doing that first, okay, you know, and understanding what you can charge and what the market will bear, not overpricing, but just getting your fair share. And that mental mindset takes time. Um, but it, it really, you know, can be powerful over that period of time. But it, it first, it's never because like, we got to look at the cost first. And it's just a flip of the switch um, to try to get people to look at it a different way. And I think when you made the introduction, the title of the book, and I'm not here to sell books, it's value first, then we'll get the price. And, and the reason why is people anchor. If I tell you it costs us $10, consciously, subconsciously, well, I can only charge to mark that up, whatever your internal numbers are. So no, it's the value to the customer. And then you look and say, wait, our cost is much less or our cost is much higher. If the cost is higher than the value, then you have a problem. So again, back to your point, it's a low value always. No, absolutely. You know, and I think really, you know, to kind of kind of add on to that, you know, is, you know, for any CEOs or product managers or anybody who's responsible for setting the price of the product, Go out, take a look, okay? Listen to Todd's journey. Listen to some of the things we're going to talk about as, as follow-up to this. But first, understand your value, what you can bring, the market, your customers, okay? And get just go out and get your fair share, okay? And you know, everybody talks about partnerships and collaboration with customers. You getting 20 and your customer getting 80% of the value isn't a fair share. You know, 50 50 is a pretty good spot to hit, in my opinion. And in most clients, when you bring it to them in that sort of light, um, understand that, you know, and really make sure you document the value that you bring, whether it's a nurse or a product or a chemical coming from my background. So, yeah. One, thing, always, one thing they always see is people look like my product versus their product, they have the same specifications chemical or a metallurgical part, right? a lot right. of the value can be the services you bring around it or yep. the knowledge of how to apply it. Yeah. You know, you know, I spent a lot of time with our sales team saying, don't give away all the knowledge because the product might not be that different. You found the problem. You told them how to solve the problem. If you give away the answers in our world day to day, it's called showrooming where people go out to a store and they steal all the ideas and then price becomes the focus. So, Learn to think of yourself, everybody, as a consultant, a lawyer. The lawyer doesn't give you the answer before they figure out how they're going to get paid. And they right. charge you based on maybe an hour, but based on the value structure of where you are and the like. So it takes a different mindset. No, and, you know, I think 
one of the examples I give a lot of people when we get into these philosophical conversations, and it's kind of where I started my career, right? You walk into any restroom or industrial facility or whatever, and I'm not going to name the companies, but those are large water treatment hygiene, you know, companies that are out there. And, you know, the, the value, biggest piece of value they bring are their applications, expertise, whether it's a restaurant and keeping that, you know, functioning properly and sanitized, whether it's a large chemical plant and getting in there and making sure the cooling towers, but they're in there as the experts and the value they bring isn't in the cost of the product they make. It's in the person that's sitting in front of them being that expert and solving those problems day in and day out. And they're, they're just masterful at, at making sure they get their fair share. And they, you know, they get their clients to win and they get their piece of it also. So uh, I think that's a great example. So Todd, in your experience, how does transitioning from a value-based model impact your relationship with a customer, really in the B2B space in particular? It, it's, it's, a, it's amazing. So one, you become partners because you're both focusing on realizing and, and, and extracting that value. A salesperson could put up a PowerPoint slide, promise all this value that the product or service will deliver. They get the check and they're on to the next call and it's goodbye. Don't need to see you again. If we're value focused, we're going to sit down, we're going to figure out what value is, and we're constantly going to be making sure that you receive it. Two, the customer is happier. They give you more opportunities because they view you as the expert. I mean, part of it you have to ask for, but hey, I solved your problem here. Do you have other issues here, here, and here? Once you become their trusted advisor, they need your help. And they've got five or 10 people they could call, but I'm in there working with them on a regular basis. We have a cadence. We're focused on solving problems that create value. They're happier. They get wins within their company. You get wins within your company. So the relationship changes. You sit beside each other instead of across the table. It's not a zero-sum negotiation. It's Please bring me more ideas to make me more profitable by solving more problems that I knew I had or didn't know I had. Yeah. I, I say respect, you know, I mean, really, it, it, it's not an easy conversation, you know, and, um, you know, with my charm and personality, sometimes I'll get a call from the sales rep or a purchasing person or, you know, whoever, hey, give me your best price. I got I need this. It's like, do you really want my best price? Because my best price is probably going to be way higher than you're going to want to get. You know? So kind of tongue in cheek at that point. But, you know, you kind of get off, you know, give me your best price in that urgency. And it's like, let's have a conversation. Why do you have the need that you have today? You know, um, you know, where you're bringing something in and you can't get it. You know, I have no problem. But we've carried inventory. We've done all sorts of other things. And we're here to serve. That's what, what we're working to do. But over time, you know, just having that open, honest conversation, you get much deeper relationships. They know what to expect. They know what not to expect. I mean, and, and sometimes, you know, you may have a smaller share and a majority is coming from somebody else, but you have that to be their flex point to be able to provide that service. And it's not the same as, you know, something else that they're they're potentially importing or getting from somebody else who just wants to, you know, crank it out all day. It's ties to the strategy and being open and honest with your clients is really the way to go. So I, I like that example. So now if we look at the B2C, well, go ahead. So I was just going to say just two quick comments, quick comments. Yeah. I promise. But what I tell some of my clients is if they're going to use you as an insurance policy, you need to charge them as an insurance policy. If they're going to use the person and they can't deliver, then you have to charge them differently because you're an insurance policy. And then I follow that up usually by saying, if a customer says to me, you know, your price is too high or what's your best price? I said, you want the best price or the best cost? What do you mean? Yeah. Then we start a different discussion. Yeah. No, I like the example we were talking there a couple months ago, right? You know, contractor, you know, is you're getting work done on your home. And if you want it done in a week and you're going to book a specific amount of time, you know, you're probably going to pay a different price than if you do it over three months and they can fill it in in the gaps in some of their other projects. So, you know, and it's it's what your tolerance is and what you're willing to do. But it's that conversation with your contractor, um, which you and I were joking about, we both have had, you know, because, you know, um, my, I'm OK if it takes a little bit longer because most of the things are are incremental changes and I can deal without a, you know, a room being completely done for a period of time, just as long as it doesn't hit Christmas because then my wife will kill me. So <laughs> there you go. Right. But, right. So you've got a lot of experience working with clients and customers in the B2C space. It's not one strike to lane. But if you take the same, you know, um, experience, you know, one of the things you always see in the B2C space is multiple pricing options, right? Good, better, best. What, what 
does that work for a business? You know, how do you market that? You know, and, and how would you go about? What are your thoughts on it's that? Kind of, I'll give you the very how this happened. I was in a class somewhere, and the professor said, "I'm going to start with some B2C examples." And I turned my computer on, saying, "This is not applicable. I'm in the B2B world." And by the second example, I think he heard me mumble a swear word under my breath, and I went, "We do this all wrong." And then I started looking at how many B2B businesses could learn from B2C. So these are a few specific examples. One is the sales team felt that they should give the customers a lot of choices. And they would create these spreadsheets with tabs. You want option A, B, C, D, E, F, add on. I mean, and what you find with you give customers too much options, they won't buy. They think they want options. They think they want choice, but it starts with buyer's remorse right away. Which one am I going to choose? You also get procurement. If option B is 100 and option C is this, and the only difference is that, then I know what that is worth. And I can start cherry picking. There's a lot of studies. We don't have time to go through them. But give choice. Don't give too much choice. So that was one. And then the next example he said is what a lot of companies in the B2B world started doing was giving two choices. And it's a horrible, with the Cadillac, the premium, the whatever, and a low price, good enough version. And what they found in the B2C world, which they also found in B2B, is if you give people a binary choice, I'll just use numbers that are simple, a $10 lock and a $20 lock, 82% of people will choose the $10 lock. The 18% will justify there's a lot of stuff in that lock and a, the last one broke, whatever. But they got to, you have to do a lot of work because they look the same, they smell the same, I don't need it. So two choices that are, you know, binary will have people justify the lower one so a lot of b2b companies have started a low price version so the good better best and the terminology is interesting but it, they say there's two things to do with the third option um one is called the decoy effect and we've all done this at some point we've gone to the uh, movie theater and i'm going to make up numbers assume there's a three dollar popcorn and a nine dollar popcorn that's three times the size so the the price per kernel is linear now, if I was given that two choices, I would sit there and say, kids, do we really need the $9? You never finished the $9. We're going for dinner after, whatever. I would justify $9 for popcorn. So the idea of uh, the decoy is to create an $8 option. It's not quite the same amount. And then you look and you say, look, for a dollar more, I get all this more. In the B2B world, Xerox has done this. Apple has done this. There's a bunch where... The middle one is not set halfway through, even though it's half the memory or half the speed for the Xerox example. It's like for a little bit more, how much more I get. So that you're using – the problem with that was the finance people want you to sell the middle one. Look at my margin on the on the $8 one that's half the size. You know, hey, guys, it's there, it's there to get the people to realize how much better the $9 one is. And the other one is the compromise effect. So I'm going to come to Philadelphia. Chad's going to take me out for dinner. And we're going to walk into a restaurant and there's going to be a $30 steak and there's going to be an $80 steak. We're both going to look at each other and go, $80 for steak, that's ridiculous. In this case, they're going to put a $250 Chateaubriand with Wagyu beef, whatever, something. Everybody will look at that. They, wow, look at that. I'm not paying $250 for a steak. $80 is good enough. Nobody ever buys the 250 that that fancy one you see. It's trying to make you look the other way around. So I got 100 business examples. We don't have time to go in it. But it's one of those things you say to businesses, think about your pricing. And I just look at myself of how I act. And I go, wow, it changes my behavior. And it happens in business. Again, there's a lot of statistics. We don't have time to worry with all of them. No. And, you know, so the, similar along those lines, you know, a lot of times, you um, when you walk into a conversation, right? You can call it a negotiation, you know, about any conversation has some degree of a negotiation going on in it. And whether it's price or service or whatever you're, you're working on with your clients and your customers, you know, um, a lot of the times when I coach and mentor sales teams, you know, I, I say to them, when you're looking at your shoes, it's hard to see if it's going to rain. It's a blue, sky's blue if there's clouds as I look at my shoes, you know. Sometimes you got to get those eyes up and that decoy example is a great example, you know, and it's just to open and expand people's, you know, mind is, is what I try to say to them, you know, so that you can look at the value because you've probably heard it a million times. I've heard it a million times. Oh, we can't quantify the customer's not going to get to us. 
don't ask one, ask 10, go downstream if you can to the, to the person that you're selling to. And you can only start putting some numbers to it. And it kind of takes time, in my opinion, but it, opening the eyes, look it up, you know, and so you can see the whole thing. So you can see the forest through the tree, so to speak, is really a key step. And I think that decoy example, I like the, the steak, I, you know, and on the popcorn one, I caught my kids into getting the biggest, most expensive one because <laughs> I eat all the popcorn and, and you know, <laughs> and so I get the whole leftovers. So you there bring you go. the kids for it, you, you get it. <laughs> yeah. So one one question here, you know, for those new to this strategy, right? What's what's the first steps? You know, and on the last episode of scaling up, you know, we talked about a little, little by little, a little becomes a lot, mm-hmm. right? You know, and that's kind of what I think about. So as you work with your clients and your customers, you know, on this pricing process, how do you kind of get them started? move them through the process to where it becomes kind of habit. Yep. No, and that, that was a great episode. I really enjoyed that one. Um, the, 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 one of the first things to do is to realize how important pricing is. And an example that I always see is that salespeople, management, talk about gross margins. I'm going to make numbers up. We have a 50% gross margin. If I have to give a 10% discount, you know, it's only 10 out of 50. No, it's not, people. Price comes from the bottom line. All I can talk about is publicly traded companies. The average B2B publicly traded company, even software, software is 70% gross margin. Their net is 10. If you give 10% off 10, it is zero. They include that in their cost of doing business, but every percent of price is everything. So if your business will make numbers up, sells a million, and then you're able to draw 100,000 and there's nothing left in the business, you know, imagine what a 5%, you know, less discounting would be, as an example. You just increased your profit by 50%. So understand the magnitude of price, the power of one, number one. Number two, sit down and say, where are the value drains and value leaks? And we, you know, one thing is giving away free services. You give away people free service, they take it, they might not appreciate it. Again, there's a way to create what's free and included because all my customers need it, all my competitors do it. I'm making numbers up. Three-day shipping, minimum order quantity of $100, whatever those are, but maybe create, you know, higher level services that you charge for. Shipping, below minimum order quantity. You're not a gold customer. I'm going to charge you for these things. So once you start putting numbers to the services you do, you can start either charging for them or changing your customer's behavior. Instead of them taking things for free, I would put a team together and just say, Let's look at two or three customer segments that we, you know, we don't need, you have to choose a customer because then you can get specific numbers, but try to look at this and say, what is the value we offer? And I do this great exercise called, so what? You know, we're more reliable, we're faster service. What does that mean to the customer? Does that mean they need less inventory? So what does that mean? That means they don't need to have the space. That means they don't need the dollars tied up. I mean, again, we don't have time. But start putting some models there and really fair. Where are we different? Where can we be different? And then say, okay, fine. How do we start pricing for this type of stuff and contracting for it? And the last, probably one of the easiest ones, believe it or not, is sit in a room and write down all your negotiation trade-offs. If that customer wants a lower price, what do you, you know, it's not a haggle. You, know, you want a lower price? Then I want longer contract. You want a lower price? I want a higher minimum order quantity. I worked with one client, they created 78 trade-offs. One of them, if you want a lower price, but this solution works, I want a video testimonial. That's a very valuable for them, and it's no cost to the customer. But they found if they waited till after it worked, most customers wouldn't do it because there was nothing in it for them. These trade-offs, you know, uh, should be a simple thing that everybody knows. This is for us to give away, but might be worth something to the customer. That costs us a lot. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and I think, you know, as I kind of walk through it with businesses, right, you know, there's a, there's a couple of kind of key things, you know, you people are calling you for a reason, whether you're a garage door company, a chemical manufacturer, there's a need right there. And so understanding that need, understanding the situation you're in and being the person that helps solve the problem that they're trying to fill and doing it where everybody wins is the way I typically get the mindset to start changing, right? do anything wrong, we're going to solve the problem, you know, and so for the garage door company, you know, I mean, they historically had offered three options, right? But 
you think about it. I said to him, I said, you're the technicians going in there. They called you, okay, and chose you over 10 different other people they probably could have called either through a referral or somebody they know. You can give them the three options, okay, but tell them the one that you recommend. Okay. But based on the situation you see, it's a 35 year old door. They can't afford to replace it today. They need a couple of wheels, but you know, they're going to replace it in five years. Don't tell them the one that's going to last 30 years and it's the best and most expensive. Go with the one that's going to get them through five years and explain that to them. You know, offering the customer, it, like to your point, causes some confusion with them and stuff. But just starting that approach little by little over time, you know, you can get to the point where you understand the market. You know, and and really, uh, when I think about it, you know, the other question they start getting is, when do you start pricing yourself out of the market? So when you get that objection time, kind of, how do you go about addressing that? Well, again, this is where, and again, this is not applicable for every industry, but if I can quantify value, customers are willing and able to pay more for it. So I might perceive that the value of A versus B is ten percent or twenty based on experience relationship. If they can put a number and say, actually, we bring 60% more value, one, you've reframed that. So if you let the customer figure out your value subconsciously, they're more reliable. They're always there when I call. That's a feeling. I'm, and some procurement people will tell me, I can give 5%. I have a room of 5%. They're local. They've been really good to us. They're always here. I got a 5% play I can get away with. If you did the math and you found out, we think that's worth this to them. It's called the value surplus. They might be able to pay you more. If you are too high, then start saying, well, then we could take this away, this away, this away. Quick, funny story. A procurement gentleman told me this once. He goes, what's hilarious, though, with sellers is I'll say, you know, you as a salesperson will say, I do this for you. And he says, what I would say is, I don't value that. And he goes, the funny thing is what salespeople do is they'll give it to me anyways. They can't not do something. They don't know how to not ship quickly. They don't know how to do the free engineering. They don't know how to do any of this stuff. And he goes, so the more I said I didn't care, the more they gave me for free. <laughs> I'm going to show you yeah. how good I am. So next time, you know, it's like, no, yeah. I just challenged you and you kept giving me free stuff. I mean, if yeah. I can get your value and not pay you for it, I will. Yeah, exactly. yeah, I will. I mean, let's be realistic here. So walk yeah. away. And that's another one. I mean, it's a tough, that's a, I know it's tough. Business is tough. is tough. There's only so many clients in a region, but you know, this is where you play good cop, bad cop. Our price is too high. You're not willing to pay for it, etc. We can negotiate these trade-offs. You're still too high. Thank you for your business in the past. We wish you all the best. Uh, and then I also had this emergency thing, you know, again, for our customers that are using us as an insurance. I mean, you don't want to threaten them, but you know, here's our structured price list for 24 hour emergency call. Now, if you're a good customer and you buy X amount from us, there's a, a different level of service that's included. And they might start thinking, whoa, am I really willing to take that risk? Or are those other people really proved it? Or if I make one phone call to you, that, that price savings I think I'm getting might go away. I've created a risk to think about. And that, you know, I mean, that there's, I don't help with somebody in commercial. Um, insurance and, and whatnot. And there's a whole bunch of really weird worlds that I'm kind of walking through. And the biggest thing that I was telling the individual is because he got a phone call from a large, you know, um, construction company, which tends to be a spot for him. It's an opportunity he was chasing for an extended period of time. And he says, Hey, I want you you know, to, to give me a price. I finally think I'm going to move towards it. And he had somebody he'd worked with for 20 years. And so they went and looked at the cost and looked at the price and the client ended up staying with their existing one because they took that offer, all the things that were added in there and the other person just matched it. And, and I, what I'm trying to, you know, help this individual understand is tell them no, like tell them, the first question you ask him is, okay, you called me. Why are you calling me? Right. And you got to tease out why me, you know, cause I don't want to get played. It's my time. And having that conversation right from the start, having that fortitude and mindset is where I kind of start with a lot of clients personally, you know, and because it'll evolve over time and just recognize to them, you know, that you have the time and stuff. So, you know, and then the other thing, cause everybody's always afraid of overpricing, you know, there's a point, but if you know the market and you know the value, that's going to tell you what it is. Okay. And, um, well, you know, overpricing. the business seats seven times as much on the same yeah. plane going to the same place. 
You know, the <laughs> iPhone is 10 times more than, I don't know what right. version, and I got a bunch of them lying around. I mean, wow. yeah, there's a bunch yep. of examples where somebody maybe find a difference <laughs> to do something or somebody didn't. And uh, back to your point, Chad, about if there's intellectual capital involved, I, if this commercial agent had to say, okay, well, here's what I propose, here's the idea, be careful you're not giving away all your ideas for free because – some people intentionally just sit back and say, oh, well, let the smart person do all the work. Now I know the rules. I can do it cheaper. I don't have the time to invest in it. I don't need the smart person. You want A, B, and C. So, again, this is, you know, more a good conversation over a coffee sometime is, okay, here's my fee. You want a customized quote, lawyer, architect. You want to customize this? Here's my fee. You buy from me, I waive the fee not doing free consulting, or I will give you very high levels. I'm not giving you the plans, the drawings. Imagine an architect giving you the drawings, then saying, do you want to pay me? I'm making up another $100,000 for the drawings. Now that I have the plans, I could be and say they're not really worth that much. So give enough to show them that you're smart. Say, I can give you a quote that covers ABC. But again, I've got to be careful. I don't give away all my knowledge because customers, some customers might cherry pick you and say, thank you. And use it with the incumbent to say that's the price or, and that's what I want. Beat it, match it, whatever. Yeah. You know what I mean? Even the, the, the insurance broker, right. You know, he, he didn't feel played, but I said, you know, you better save yourself a whole bunch of time. If you really, you really want to stay there. I, um, you know, here's the skills I bring. Here's why, you know, things I would think about. I'd like, you yeah, help you, but I'm not going to go through all the quote process, which i really, really long and a lot of time. And it, it took him a couple of days, you know, from not doing other things to do it. And I said, just kind of cut to the chase and he's really kind of comfortable. And, and not that the person who came to him with the quote, I think he, you know, he feels he was legitimate and coming to him and stuff. But then when, you know, push came to shove, the ultimate underwire wasn't there for the change. So and the last thing I'll just say there, it's already yeah. the conversation is I will tell clients afterwards, if you keep using me as your free engineering department was the term we would use. Yeah. There will be a fee from now. I mean, again, in your CRM system, you know, this. how many times has this person called you, use their time, and you know they use somebody else afterwards? That's a no bid. And what's great yeah. is some companies will say, well, you have to bid. No, I don't have to. There's no law that says I have to bid. I need you to bid. Why? Well, I have to have you in the game. No, no. Then, I mean, then there's a fee for this or something. But there are always those clients that just use you for your knowledge and time and expertise and then take it. So that's a good no, absolutely. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And I mean, it's just, it's just, you know, it's, if you go on the value base, right where we started, it, you know, you understand your market. It's just command and respecting yourself in a way too. Right. I'm not going to, cause I'm, I walked into businesses and, and the, the, well, this annual bid's coming up for, you know, big coal fire power plants wants to buy some bromine and real example. Every year it would get put in. It was like, what? <laughs> Everybody goes sharp in their pencils to try to figure out what it was. And like five years in a row, we didn't get it. Didn't even come close. And it was like, why are we doing this? Just, you know, give them target market price. <laughs> you know, it's the, we'll never win the bid. We never won it doing it the other way. And eventually over time, they knew that they needed us. Okay. Cause we were a domestic producer and, and we supplemented them and we came to a better relationship and agreement. But now that's, uh, you're certainly right. You gave me what you have to. It's like, you don't have to. Okay, it's your time. You can allocate it to where you see fit. So, well, Todd, it's been a fascinating discussion. I could talk here all day about pricing and we could get into everything from popcorn to chemicals to paper. But uh, I've learned a lot about the intricacies and benefits of value-based pricing through our conversations. I hope the audience does today also as they listen to this. And thank you for sharing your insights. You know, don't forget to subscribe to us and give us a five-star rating on your favorite podcast platform. Stay tuned for our next episode of Scaling Up. Until next time, thank you.